My sister and I pulled up to the Taco Bell drive-thru on Devin. I was driving because we'd just come from a club and Tracy was extremely drunk. Well, not extremely drunk, but she definitely wasn't in the right headspace to drive. There were three cars ahead of us, meaning we'd have to wait for a little bit. But Tracy moaned impatiently. Calm down, I told her. It won't take too long. Tracy scoffed. Just nudge them, she said, slurring her words. She pointed towards the expensive-looking sports car in front of us. <laughs> Was she seriously suggesting that I drive into the car in front of us? What possible good would that do? <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to do that. She pushed me hard. I knew she was intoxicated, so she couldn't control her own strength, but it still hurt. I also knew that she was still mad at me for dating her ex-boyfriend Todd, but that didn't give her a right to shove me. Then she grabbed the wheel, as if she was going to take over, like she was commandeering the vehicle or something. I swatted her hand away, but my foot lifted off the brake and the car inched forward. I slammed on the brake. The sports car was less than a foot in front of us. I could see the couple sitting inside. The man at the driver's seat turned around and looked at us. He glared. I waved apologetically and shut off the engine. This is going to take a while anyway. A truck pulled up behind us, blocking us in, and the line still wasn't moving. For the first time, I realized that we were completely closed in. The vehicle in front of us and the vehicle behind us. To our right was the restaurant wall and to the left was the concrete divider. There was absolutely no way out. I felt a sudden sting of claustrophobia. Uh, so, so what do you want? I asked Tracy. Oh, I'm not hungry. I couldn't believe it. Getting to the Taco Bell was her idea. She screamed at me until I gave in. Then why? I started. Because the drive throughs always busy, she answered. I knew we'd be trapped inside. Her voice changed. Before she had been slurring her words, now she sounded stone-cold sober. Had it all but an act? Was she only pretending to be drunk? Now that I thought about it, I don't remember seeing her ordering anything at the club. But it didn't make sense. None of this did. You... you wanted us just to wait in line? I asked. I wanted your undivided attention, she said darkly, without any chance of escape. My pulse quickened. She was right. We had absolutely no way to escape with these concrete doors on either side of us. That was when Tracy pulled out a long silver knitting needle from her handbag. She used it for sewing things on her TikTok channel, but I had no idea she brought it with her. She began to wave it through the air, its sharp tip getting dangerously close to my face. She whispered my name a few times, and then she asked me, why did you take Todd from me? I was gobsmacked. We'd already had several long discussions about it. I already explained the situation, that they'd broken up for a year, and we'd gotten pretty close in the last few months, that she dated plenty of my exes. She cried a bit, but she hadn't brought it up for weeks. I looked at the couple in front of us. They were having a nice conversation. No clue that my sister was threatening me with a needle, just one car back. I looked in the rear view with the truck behind us. The driver was texting, completely oblivious. I carefully asked Tracy to put down the needle, but instead, she gripped it tight and held its tip against my throat. Don't do this, I whispered. I pushed my head into the headrest but Tracy just moved the needle closer. She laughed, but didn't sound drunk at all. Just insane. I was thinking, she said, that maybe you and Todd should split up. I didn't say anything. My breathing quickened, and the only sound I heard was the thudding of my pulse as it echoed in my eardrum. 
Tracy pushed the needle into my skin. I could feel its tip digging in as the single trickle of blood oozed out. My breathing was fast, forcing my throat to move up and down, which only made the needle dig in further. She waited for my answer. I was frozen. Was this what Tracy planned all along? She wanted us to get trapped in the drive through She wanted to threaten me in a place where I couldn't escape, all because of some guy she dated before me. Tracy twisted the needle. I couldn't tell if it was digging in any further, but I knew that if she went even a centimeter more, that she would strike my artery. I felt like I was trapped in a nightmare where my muscles weren't working. I wanted to move, to grab the needle out of her hand, to throw it out of the window, but I just couldn't move. My arms, my legs, nothing would move. Well, Tracy tried again. I closed my eyes and forced every part of my body to relax. All my muscles were tensed. And then I had to use all my brain power to loosen everything. I tried to think of my yoga classes and meditation and lying on the beach. Slowly, a bit of fear ebbed away. It wasn't a lot. I was still petrified. But it was enough to regain my ability to move. I reached one hand up and grabbed Tracy by the wrist. I snapped it back, forcing the needle to fall onto the floor. I slammed my foot on top so she couldn't grab it with both hands. I held Tracy down. I screamed. I was loud enough for the couple in the sports car ahead of me to hear me. They both turned and saw me holding my sister in place. They clearly saw that there was something wrong, and violence was happening in the car. But they chose to turn their head and ignore us. Tracy shoved me back and pulled a second needle from her bag. Before I could block, she held it to my face. Will you break up with Todd? She asked through her teeth. The needle was so close that its tiny tip was nothing more than a fuzzy dot in the center of my vision. So close. So terrifyingly close. Yes, I said. I'll dump him. Tracy pulled the needle away, then stuck it back in her purse. She smiled as if nothing happened. The sports car pulled away, and we were finally free to drive away. Oh, Tracy added. I changed my mind. Can you order me a chalupa? I'd been working at my local Taco Bell for around two months when my co-worker Max started acting weird. At first, it almost seemed like he was experiencing some kind of personality shift. He was normally a super friendly and amicable guy, and we'd gotten on well in the months we'd been working together. He was a long-standing employee of Taco Bell, too, having worked at several different branches over the years, and I knew he liked his job and took it seriously. So, when he started acting irritable and off-putting around the customers, I knew there was something wrong. I pulled him aside one afternoon while the restaurant was quiet and asked him what was wrong. He looked at me like I'd said something stupid, his lip curling, Nothing's wrong, he said, his voice grittier than usual, like he'd been swallowing rocks. You've just seemed a bit off recently, that's all, I said, trying not to sound overbearing. I was just making sure everything's okay. He furrowed his brows. It's not me who's been acting weird, he said suddenly. Don't you think the customers have been exceptionally rude lately? I stared at him, trying to figure out what he meant. As far as I was aware, we hadn't had to deal with any impolite customers or disturbances. Everything had been pretty normal. The only thing that was different was Max's demeanor. But apparently, he didn't see it as a problem. I shrugged, trying to choose my next words carefully. I didn't want to agitate him more than he already was. Judging by the way he was shifting his feet and clenching and unclenching his hands, something was definitely bothering him. Don't look at me like that. He blurted before I could get a word out. I blinked at him. 
like what? I said, taking a subconscious step back at the outburst. You're looking at me like I'm stupid, he continued. Just like the others, you're all looking down on me. His raised voice was starting to attract attention, so I spread my hands trying to calm him down. I'm not looking down on you at all, I said. Why don't you take a little break and- Don't tell me what to do, Max seed, spittle flying from his lips. I cowered back, trying to figure out what to do when our area manager, Sarah, stepped in. Max, she said, her voice like a whip. My office, now. My coworker skulked off, his shoulders trembling, and I hurried to catch Sarah before she disappeared after him. Is he okay? I've never heard him raise his voice like that. I said, scratching the back of my head. He's normally such a great guy. Sarah pursed her lips. I'll talk to him, she said. But behavior like that is not acceptable, regardless of how unusual it is. I nodded, watching her leave before returning to the order counter. Max ended up getting suspended and advised to seek out some kind of anger management therapist. I thought it was a little extreme given his past track record, but I didn't have the gall to argue with the higher-ups, so I kept quiet about it. As it turned out, Max's sudden irritability was the least of our worries. He wasn't the only one who started to change. Amy was one of the employees who worked in the kitchen at the back. It was only a small branch, so there wasn't too many of us, and after Max was suspended, it almost seemed too quiet. Amy had always been nice to me, if a little brusque in her way of speaking, but it had never bothered me before, not until she started to get aggressive, just like Max. I noticed the orders were taking a while to complete, so I headed into the kitchen to see if there was any issue and found Amy standing with a knife in her hand, her shoulders trembling. Amy? Is everything okay? I asked growing alarmed when she turned to face me. Her eyes were wide and frantic, searching around the kitchen for something I couldn't see. D did you see where it went? Where what went? I said, eyeing the knife in her hand. Amy's breasts were coming out in short, sharp pants, like she was high on adrenaline. The, the monster! Did you, did you see it? I stared at her, trying to understand what she was talking about. Monster? I echoed incredulously. I saw it. It, it. it was here. It was watching me. She spoke in a scattered voice, still clutching onto the steak knife. Well, I think it's gone now, so uh, uh, maybe put the knife down. Before either of us could do anything else, the door swung open and Sarah walked in. What on earth? Amy screamed when she saw Sarah a high-pitched wail of fear that sent my hairs on end. M monster she shrieked, before rushing towards the manager with a knife held aloft, her eyes wide and frantic. I watched in horror as Amy lunged for Sarah with the knife. Thankfully, Sarah managed to dive out of the way just in time, and Amy went crashing into the counter beside her. Call the police! Sarah screamed at me, spurring me into action. I ran for the phone, my hands trembling as I dialed 911 and gave a harried explanation of what was going on. Amy was still screaming about monsters, but she'd lost the knife now and Sarah was doing a good job of keeping her constrained in a vice-like grip. I'd never had as much respect for someone as I did for Sarah right then, watching her hold onto Amy like her life depended on it. The police arrived shortly after, apprehending Amy and taking some witness statements. I told them what had happened reiterating that it wasn't like Amy at all. She was normally so rational and cool-headed that seeing her rush at Sarah with a knife had been like watching a stranger. It wasn't lost on me that the same thing happened to Max, and Sarah was smart enough to realize that something was wrong too, only neither of us knew what. It was a few days later when the answer would come to light. We found the mold growing behind the freezers in the kitchen. It was Sarah who had noticed it, the mottled black stains peeking out from behind the upper fridge. She freaked out as soon as she saw it, and I didn't blame her. Not only was it a huge hygiene risk, 
Neither of us had ever seen anything like it before. It was completely odorless, like tiny black veins running through the kitchen tiles, spider webbing out into a massive mural. It was a wonder nobody had noticed it before since it had obviously been there for a while. We temporarily closed the restaurant and called in an expert to safely deal with it, but even he seemed stumped by what kind of fungus it was. He was reluctant to get close without understanding what it was, so he ended up calling in backup to investigate the outbreak. According to the guys in hazmats who took samples, it was a rare type of fungus that causes a variety of side effects to those who breathed in the spores, increased irritability, paranoia, and hallucinations being among them. The restaurant was closed for months while the outbreak was contained and cleaned up. I never heard what happened to Max and Amy, but I hope they both knew it wasn't their fault with what had happened. I guess I was simply lucky that I was usually the one taking orders. If I'd spent more time in the kitchen, breathing in those spores, there's no telling what might have happened to me. The house had to be on the market for a while, which should have been my first warning sign. It was detached, two-story house in a rural area, with no neighbors and beautiful views, and yet nobody snatched it up since it was put on sale about seven months ago. It was perfect for me and my family, so we put in an offer and got accepted right away. It was like a dream come true, until we heard the rumors. They spread around us like flies, buzzing in our ears whenever we went into town. Apparently, someone had gone missing in that house over a year ago. It was like they had vanished without a trace. Police had investigated for months and had found nothing. No evidence, no suspects, no body, nothing. So eventually the case was dropped, the family moved out, and the house was put up for sale. And now we are living there. I tried not to let the stories bother me. People had a tendency to gossip and exaggerate, and I was certain that it had simply been a case of the child getting lost in the woods, maybe somewhere off of the property, and just had a sad demise. But my wife was pretty rattled by it. She suggested moving somewhere else, but we sunk all of our money into the house and wouldn't be able to relocate unless we resold it right off the bat, which would prove impossible with all the other silly rumors. So we just had to stick through it. It was like any old house at first. It needed a bit of work, but nothing drastic. It was all functioning fine. The kids loved it too. They'd always been the adventurous sort, and being able to explore all the rooms and play in the forest was perfect for them. As long as they stayed together and didn't go too far from the house, I let them play where they wanted, until one of them went missing. One day, my oldest Claire came to me crying. We were playing upstairs, she said tearily, her cheeks pink in the way they always went when she was upset. But I needed to use the bathroom, so I left Jack alone. I was only gone for a few minutes, but when I got back, he was gone. I thought maybe he was pulling a prank on me, so I went looking for him, but I couldn't find him. I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have left him alone. I wiped away her tears on her cheeks and pulled her into a tight hug. It's all right. We'll go looking for him together, okay? She nodded, taking my hand, and we went upstairs to go and see where Jack went. I knew that my wife would be hysterical if she came home and found our son was missing, so... I was determined to find him before she got home. He was two years younger than Claire, but he liked to be independent and pretend he was older than six, and I knew Claire's status being the big sister made her overly protective, which is why I didn't want her blaming herself. It was nobody's fault, and I'm sure Jack was just probably hiding somewhere, being stubborn is all. Were you playing in your room? I asked as we reached the top of the landing. It was dreary overcast, and the hallways were covered in shadows. Only a mirage spattering of light came from a single window above the stairs. Yeah, Claire said. In here. I glanced around, and there were some toys on the floor, puzzles and action figures that they must have been playing with, but 
No sign of Jack. Jack, if you're hiding somewhere, come out now, I called. The rest of the house was silent. I began to search the room, peering under the bed and checking the closet, but he was nowhere to be seen. Shall I go and look downstairs? Claire offered, but I shook my head. No, uh, stay with me, I told her. I was sure nothing bad had happened to Jack, but I was still nervous about leaving Claire alone. I'd rather not lose both of them. We searched the entire house, and I still couldn't find any trace of Jack. It was starting to get dark outside, and I was on the verge of calling the police. Even Jack would have shown himself by now if he was actually hiding. Where's he gone, Daddy? Claire asked me, her eyes trembling with the threat of more tears. I, I don't know, I admitted. But we'll find him, okay? I promise. There was a chance he'd gotten himself stuck somewhere. It was an old house, and judging by the draughts that I often felt, full of holes and hidden alcoves, maybe he was simply lost. Uh, all right, uh, I'll have one more look upstairs, I told Claire as she clutched onto my sleeve. Stay with me, okay? I headed back upstairs, trying to imagine in my head where a six-year-old boy would go. If he was hiding from his sister, the most likely place he would be would be in one of the closets. He wasn't in his room, but I hadn't fully checked the one in the hallway, so that's where I had to look. We were using it as a storage cupboard for towels and brooms and the like, but as I peered into the shadows, I felt the cold touch of a breeze flowing from somewhere inside. I began pulling out everything that was in there until I could see the back panel of the closet. There was a hole in the wood, wide enough for someone to crawl through. Had Jack gone in there? Wait here, I instructed Claire, before dropping to my hands and knees and crawling over the gap. Jack? Jack, are you in there? I held my breath, waiting for an answer. Somewhere in the distance, a very faint voice called back. Dad? Dad? Jack, I said in a tide of relief. Oh, thank God you're okay. Can you get out? No, I, I fell. I, I can't move my leg. Okay, I I'm coming to get you. I broke the wooden panel with my hands until I could fit through and climbed into the gap. Shaking the dust and cobwebs from my shoulders, I found myself in a small passage behind the closet. It was narrow and I couldn't stand up, but I could crawl through it. Nose wrinkling at the smell, I began to move forward, following my son's voice. Before long, I reached a wide hole in the floorboards below me, and when I peered down into the darkness, a small, terrified face stared back. Jack! Swinging my legs through the gap, I jumped down, coughing on the dust that clung to my lungs. He was huddled in the corner of a room, clutching his leg. I immediately pulled him into my arms. Oh God, I'm so glad you're okay, I said, holding him tight until he began to squirm. Dad, we're not alone down here, he whispered, his voice strangled. And when I asked him what he meant, he stretched his finger and pointed to the corner of the room. At first, I didn't see anything. But as my eyes adjusted, I saw the glint of something white, and nausea gripped my stomach. Bones. There were bones down here. And I realized then, with mounting horror, that I had found the missing girl. They had been here, beneath the house the whole time. I managed to get Jack out in one piece and bandage him up before phoning the police and reporting the body. Later that evening, when I told my wife, she wanted to move. <laughs> and I didn't argue. <laughs>